In 2011, 28-year-old Jared Edward Hanna was a father to two daughters and living in Jerseyville, Illinois. At the beginning of July 2011, Jared's daughters were visiting their mother in St. Louis, Missouri for the weekend. On Saturday, July 2nd, around 11.30 a.m., Jared left home with his fishing gear and some bait, never to be seen again. When he didn't return home that night, his family assumed he had decided to camp out for the rest of the weekend. Then, on Monday, July 4th, his sister Heather received a call from Jared's ex asking if he was home. She said he had failed to show up yesterday to pick up their daughters and wasn't answering his cell phone. She had last heard from him around 9.30 p.m. on July 2nd when he called to check on the girls. On Tuesday, July 5th, Jared's mother, Pat, received a call from the police informing her that Jared's 1990 GMC Sierra, which was in her name, had been found abandoned about 70 miles away in Clinton County, Illinois. A deputy had spotted the truck on the side of Joe Liffa Bridge Road while driving home early Sunday morning, but didn't stop until Tuesday when he saw the vehicle was still there. At this point, a missing person report was filed. Investigators found surveillance footage from a Jerseyville Amoco station around 11.45 a.m. on Saturday, the day he left. He was seen going inside and buying a can of soda. Around 12.30 p.m., his cell phone pinged off a tower in East Alton, Illinois, indicating he was heading south after leaving the gas station. He eventually ended up in Centralia, which is where he made the phone call to his daughters at 9.30 p.m. on July 2nd. After that call, his cell phone stopped pinging, meaning it was either turned off or the battery had died. Jared was familiar with the Centralia area and had even worked there once. Come to find out, some of his old co-workers told him about a private fishing area in Centralia, and since he took his fishing gear with him on the morning he left, that's most likely where he was heading. Authorities searched the fishing spot and the area where his vehicle was found, but there were no clues to his whereabouts. As for Jared's GMC Sierra, it looked like it had ran out of gas. A witness then came forward and confirmed this, saying they saw a man walking on the road carrying a gas can. Interestingly, the man was seen wearing a wife beater, which Heather said her brother never wore. It's possible the man wasn't actually Jared and had stolen the gas instead. Plus, when the vehicle was returned to the family and they put gas in it, it started right up. A mechanic said that if the truck had actually run out of gas, it would have been impossible to start without priming the gas pedal a few times to get the fuel back in the fuel system. Because of this, his family believes that Jared or someone else left the truck there and then siphoned the gas out. Jared's vehicle also looked like it had been ransacked and his guitar and amplifier were missing. Unfortunately, investigators never did forensics on the truck. A couple of miles away from where his vehicle was found, a resident in a mobile home on College Road said that a man believed to be Jared knocked on their door around 8.30 Sunday morning and asked for directions to Casey's General Store, which was more than five miles away. They said he also asked for a drink of water. After drinking two glasses, the man went on his way. Over three months later, on October 10th, 2011, a black shoulder bag belonging to Jared was found on the banks of Crooked Creek, about a mile and a half away from where his truck had been found. The bag contained Jared's wallet, cell phone, video camera, tools, and keys. Some of his clothing and a pair of shoes were also found nearby. Heather has since adopted Jared's daughters and continues to search for answers. However, as of 2024, Jared has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Lacey Claire Gaines was born on December 1, 1989, to parents Jeffrey and Gilda and grew up in Crete, Illinois. When Lacey was 16 years old, she was working at her uncle's restaurant in Crete called Fix on Main. That's where she met Rogelio Alvarado Sanchez, who was 10 years older than she was and went by Daniel. The two began dating, but Lacey soon learned that he was a very possessive and controlling person who would get extremely jealous when Lacey would talk to her guy friends at school. In 2007, she became pregnant by Daniel and moved in with him and his family in Stager, Illinois. That wouldn't last long, and so they moved in with Daniel's brother, Abraham. 
Lacey began to complain to her family and friends about the abuse from Daniel, but she felt like her comments were falling on deaf ears. Daniel had an uncontrollable rage and even choked her out one time, a claim that Lacey's family members were able to confirm after seeing the marks around her neck. Daniel's own brother, Abraham, was the one who pulled him off of Lacey during the attack. Later that year, in October 2007, Lacey's father purchased a home in Stager that he planned to refurbish. After the refurbishment was complete, Lacey moved in and began making the mortgage payments. A few months later, in January 2008, her son was born. However, the relationship between her and Daniel continued to worsen, with him physically and mentally abusing her on a regular basis. Co-workers even noticed her showing up at the Waffle House, where she worked, with bruises all over her arms. By late 2008, she had had enough and ended the relationship. Meanwhile, she met a man named Juan Valadez, whom her friends and family loved. The two then began living together with Juan's sisters in Chicago, Illinois, which enraged Daniel and caused his jealousy to worsen. At this point, he was stalking and sending death threats to Lacey. On February 9, 2009, Lacey filed a police report due to the threatening text messages she was receiving from him. Daniel had been threatening to take their baby back to Mexico with him through text messages on a phone that Lacey's mother was paying for. While this sounds crazy, the explanation from Lacey's mother was that she kept paying for it out of fear that he would kidnap the baby and go to Mexico, and the phone was the only way to keep contact and possibly even track him. In May of 2009, Lacey and her son moved into the Sunset Lake Apartments in Justice, Illinois. Her parents were unhappy about her decision to move there because it was a high crime area known for drugs. Her boss at the Kingsbury Waffle House, Jimmy Chiakuris, was the one who helped her find the apartment. He was also allegedly helping her pay bills and taking her to and from work. During this time, Lacey and Juan continued dating and even made plans to marry. However, by late 2009, she had asked her father if she and her son could move back home. He agreed but wanted to know why, but she couldn't give him a reason. Strangely, she wanted to do this without Juan. It's also of note that she had recently been complaining to friends and family about Juan. However, on December 4, 2009, Lacey spoke with her friend Julian and said she was excited about her upcoming wedding to Juan. On December 7, 2009, Lacey had a doctor's appointment and left her son in the care of her grandmother. A few hours later, Juan, who was returning from California, shockingly found Lacey's body in the apartment with blood all over the floor. Since Juan barely spoke English, an unidentified woman called 911 for him. This unidentified woman was allegedly with Juan when he found Lacey's body. Lacey was then rushed to the Advocate Christ Medical Center in Oaklawn, where she was sadly pronounced dead on arrival. An autopsy revealed that she had been strangled with an electrical cord before being fatally stabbed in the neck. A large kitchen knife that belonged to Lacey was found at the scene and determined to be the murder weapon. The medical examiner also concluded that the murderer was right-handed and was about the same height as Lacey. Since the weapon came from Lacey's apartment, they don't believe the attack was planned, but the person was clearly enraged because the murder was described as an overkill. There were also no signs of sexual assault or defensive wounds. It appeared she knew her killer because there were no signs of forced injury. There's also the possibility the killer had a key. Daniel quickly became a prime suspect in the case, but after hours of interviews and interrogations and passing a polygraph, he was ultimately ruled out. Some believe that Lacey was murdered by someone Daniel knew. Interestingly, on December 14, 2009, a detective on the case said he knew who committed the murder but didn't have enough evidence to make the case. At the time of the murder, Daniel had a bond forfeiture warrant out for his arrest for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. So, if Daniel was ruled out, who was the detective talking about? It could have been Daniel before he was ruled out. Things in this case get even stranger. I'm going to back up a bit to two days after Lacey's murder when victim advocates Robin Sachs and Susan Murphy Milano received a mysterious letter from an anonymous person. The letter is quite long, but I will try and sum it up the best I can. Also, all this information is from the letter itself, and I'm not saying it's 100% true, although it seems pretty legit. 
but you will hear me say allegedly a lot and sorry there are no pictures of the individuals and trust me I searched all over the internet for them. While Lacey was living at Sunset Lake Apartments in Justice, Illinois, she apparently got a job working at Park Management, the agency that managed the apartment complex. The property owner was a man named Joe Ghetto, who is allegedly a multimillionaire who owns multiple other properties. Joe had allegedly been involved with many women who were half his age and younger. After he and his wife Lynn divorced, she allegedly said she wanted nothing to do with him because of his affairs with very young women that she called children. It's alleged that Joe referred to these younger women as strays. I actually believe his wife's name is Linda and not Lynn. Maybe she went by Lynn, though. A woman named Irene Downs, who was the inner property manager, allegedly set him up with her daughter, and the two began an affair. In the letter, Irene's last name was spelled Dolls instead of Downs. After the affair with her daughter ended, Irene stood by Joe, and the daughter cut all ties with the both of them. Irene then abruptly left the company in the summer of 2009. Joe's brother John also worked for the company and lived at Sunset Lakes Apartments in Unit 304, which is the same building as the office. John had served time in prison for robbery and around the time of Lacey's murder had just completed a five-year probation. It's alleged that both Joe and John are narcissists who are very demeaning to women but can also be very charismatic. In September 2009, Joe fired Lacey because of an affair she was allegedly having with an office co-worker. After being fired, she continued to live at the apartment complex. The person who wrote the letter said they were told by someone in January 2010 that Lacey was allegedly a very sexually promiscuous person who was also involved with several men she worked with, including office workers, maintenance men, and security guards who were off-duty police officers. Allegedly, she had been spreading STDs around, and the person who murdered her had contracted one and was pissed about it after it was passed on to their wife or girlfriend. The person was allegedly an illegal immigrant who had fled back to Mexico after the murder. It's of note that a third brother by the name of Steve Ghetto also lived in the apartment complex in the same building as Lacey and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder several years before Lacey's murder. The letter ends by accusing the justice police of being paid off by someone trying to cover up the murder. Was the illegal immigrant a maintenance worker at the apartment complex? A person named Bernita, who posted a review of the complex on January 30th, 2010, seems to think so. Unfortunately, it seems that Lacey led a very entangled life, and if her killer really was an illegal immigrant, it might almost be impossible to track him down. It's now been over 14 years since her murder, and as of 2024, it remains unsolved. Trudy Leanne Appleby was born on September 4, 1984. In 1996, at the age of 11, Trudy was a sixth grader living in Moline, Illinois, and was described as a vivacious, lively, and bold individual. During the summer of 1996, Trudy was invited to go swimming on Campbell's Island with a friend she knew through her father. However, Dennis said no because of an upcoming trip they were taking and said Trudy needed to pack instead. Apparently, Trudy decided to go swimming anyway, and on the morning of August 21st, 1996, about an hour after Dennis left for work, a neighbor saw her getting into a silver, four-door, box-style vehicle similar to a Chevrolet Celebrity in the driveway of her home. The driver of the truck was described as a white man in his 20s, wearing a ball cap with curly brown or black hair to his shoulders. When Dennis returned home for his lunch break, he noticed Trudy gone, but thinking she was possibly at a friend's home that she often visited, he went back to work. When he returned home that evening and found her still gone, he reported her missing. At the time, Trudy's mother, Brenda Edelman, and grandmother, Willa Ann, had gone camping. During the investigation, it was determined that Trudy was wearing a black swimsuit and carrying a towel with her when she left that morning. Trudy had saved up about $200 for their upcoming vacation, and that money was still in the home. So clearly, she had intentions of coming home after going swimming. 20 years later, William Smith, who went by Ed, was identified as the prime suspect in Trudy's disappearance. 
Not only did he have access to a vehicle similar to the one that picked up Trudy, but it was scrapped not long after she disappeared. Ed was a friend of Dennis's who died in 2014. Ed's son-in-law, David Whipple, lived across the street from him in 1996 and saw Trudy in his car that day. Ed then allegedly threatened to kill David if he told the police about it. Ed is a registered sex offender who was convicted of sexually abusing a 10-year-old girl in Rock Island County, Illinois. Trudy's father theorizes that Ed, along with David Whipple, took Trudy out on a boat on the Mississippi River and something unexpected happened, perhaps an accident that led to her death. Trudy was friends with one of David's children and frequently accompanied their family on the boat. The lead detective in her case believes that the men convinced Trudy that her dad said it was all right for her to go swimming that day. In January 2019, Moline police seized a boat believed to be connected to Trudy's disappearance. They, along with the FBI, were notified of the boat's existence in December 2018 and received information that the boat may have been used to transport Trudy on the day she disappeared. The boat was examined by the FBI crime lab in Springfield, Illinois, but it's unclear what they found. A third person of interest was Jameson A. Fisher, who went by Jamie. He was a lifelong friend of Ed and his family. Investigators stated they believe Jamie and David may have helped Ed cover up whatever caused her presumed death. In May 2021, Jamie was sentenced to prison on an unrelated auto theft charge and is due to be released in 2026. David, also a registered sex offender like Ed, refused to fully cooperate with investigators in Trudy's disappearance. He died in August 2022 at the age of 61. In August of 2023, 27 years after Trudy went missing, the Moline police executed a search warrant in the 600 block of 8th Street in Kelowna on Campbell's Island, but nothing related to Trudy was found. Sadly, Trudy's mother, Brenda, passed away in 2014 after being struck by a drunk driver. It's now been over 25 years since Trudy disappeared, and her father is still searching for answers. But as of 2024, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Vincent Wesselman was born on December 12, 1935, in southern Illinois and went by Vance. He grew up in a very loving household with 11 siblings. After high school, he served in the U.S. Army in the 1950s. Vince never married or had children and spent his life as a bachelor. After being discharged from the military, he got a job at a stove company for a few years before getting hired on at a nearby clothing store called Men's Formal Wear. Vince's family was very important to him, and he spent his money to build him and his family a home in Breeze, Illinois. Once it was built, he moved his younger siblings and parents in. He then took care of his parents until their deaths. After that, he spent most of his time volunteering and helping others. Vince was known for being an avid gardener who donated his produce to a local food pantry named House of Manna. He also worked and helped Habitat for Humanity build houses for 18-plus years. On top of that, he volunteered at a Catholic youth camp each year and attended church several times a week. He was a very active 70-year-old who loved to walk and ride his bike. On Thursday, April 21, 2011, 75-year-old Vince had only been retired from men's formal wear for a few weeks and was replacing the floor in his home with the help of his brother, Jerry. It was Holy Thursday, the day before Good Friday, and Vince planned to attend church that evening or at least attend services on Friday night. He also had plans to meet his family for an Easter meal on Sunday. Jerry left Vince's home and had plans to come back a few days later to help him finish the flooring project, but sadly, this would never happen. The following day, on Good Friday, Vince was seen walking near the Breeze Grain Company. He was crossing the train tracks at South Broadway and South Walnut Street, headed east. He was most likely en route to the post office. Vince was known for walking to the post office, which was only about half a mile from his house, on an almost daily basis to get his newspaper and mail. Unfortunately, he would never make it to the post office that day. That evening, friends and family found it strange that he was not at Good Friday Mass. 
By the next day, when they still had not heard from him, they called the police and reported him missing. When the police arrived at his home, they found his car, bicycle, money, and keys all inside the house. His house was not ransacked and nothing appeared to have been taken. His church clothes for the evening were laid out on the bed. While it does appear he went missing while out on his walk, some conflicting reports said he wasn't even seen that day and the last time he was seen was by Jerry the night before. If he was walking toward the post office and witness accounts are correct, then he most likely vanished somewhere between the Breeze Grain Company and the post office. Police initially wondered if Vince had fallen into a body of water that had flooded due to the rain that evening, but even when the weather dried up significantly, nothing of Vince's was found. Farmers were asked to check their fields to see if they could find anything, but nothing was reported. The community and law enforcement searched the town from top to bottom, but sadly never found Vince. An odd tidbit is that a neighbor who saw Vince on Wednesday reported that he seemed disoriented, but admitted that they had only seen him across the road and hadn't spoken to or interacted with him that day. The police have three possible theories. The first theory is that during his walk, it began to rain heavily, causing him to take shelter in an outbuilding, cave, tree wall, or in someone's abandoned car, and subsequently pass away from the elements. The other theory is that someone saw Vince walking and offered him a ride. That person then murdered Vince for an unknown reason. The last theory is that Vince had a medical issue while on his walk and passed away. Honestly, to me, the last two theories are the most plausible. If someone did pick him up, they might have thought he had cash on him and murdered him for it. The medical issue theory also makes sense because while Vince was in good health, he had experienced a mini stroke in the past. It's definitely possible that he became disoriented and wandered off far enough that nobody has been able to find his body. Some online believe he might have been fasting for Good Friday and that's why he became disoriented. Unfortunately, without a body, it's hard to know exactly what happened. Sadly, as of 2024, Vince has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Vignette Trudy Teague was born on December 8, 1981. In 1983, 18-month-old Vignette lived on the seventh floor of the Robert Taylor Holmes apartment building in Chicago, Illinois. She lived there with her parents and three older brothers, and her grandparents also lived in the building. On the evening of June 25, 1983, at 9.20 p.m., Vignette's parents left her in the care of her grandmother while they went to a drive-in movie. The breezeway of the building that night was bustling with people coming and going, especially members of the Teague family. When her mother, Kathy, returned from the movies at 3 a.m., she heard a neighbor screaming her name, asking if she had Vignette. That's when she saw several police cars and instinctively knew that something bad happened to Vignette. Vignette's grandmother said that after the parents left, she needed to take a phone call and left Vignette briefly in the arms of a neighbor. However, the neighbor holding Vignette placed the child in the hallway in front of the grandmother's apartment door and returned to their own apartment. Although the building was packed with people and there were only three exits, nobody saw anything suspicious. Authorities reportedly believe that a non-family member abducted Vignette. Authorities, Vignette's family, and neighbors searched the housing complex one floor at a time, questioning people as they went. However, there was still no sign of Vignette. Unfortunately, there is little information in this case, but if Vignette were alive today, she would be 42 years old. However, as of 2024, she's never been found, and this case remains unsolved.